This is your host, Samil Bharatiya, and welcome to another episode of TFR Let's Talk. And today we have with us Pavel Spot, Senior Product Marketing Manager Cloud at Akamai Technologies. Pavel, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks for, uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this discussion uh, because, you know, we want to talk about AWS Reven, you know, one of the big uh, shows of the year. Folks are returning to physical events. So, and, you know, we've done some analysis, so a lot of announcements, but there are not that many announcements that we're expecting. But there are certain things which were like, you know, oh, we were not expecting this. Oh, hey, this is what you expect there. So if I ask you, when you like most of the event was all over because it's not just that you had your own take you talked to a lot of folks also partners competitors so so talk a bit about from your perspective not from the amazon's perspective but from your perspective what are the some of the big announcements uh, that were there it's uh, it's funny we we did talk to uh, we, we did love the opportunity to talk to folks like you said uh, after after quite a bit of a, a gap, and if I was to take their perspective, and, and maybe it's it's among the more cynical perspective, is the big announcement was that there was no announcement. Um, I, I'm not entirely of that uh, of that camp, though. I mean, certainly there there's a lot to talk about, but what I'd call out is data. Certainly took the stage. Uh, CEO, uh, you know, uh, the the day two keynote was talked a lot about data. Same thing with uh, Swami's day three keynote, talked about data and machine learning. And and I I would agree in what they're doing because it makes sense, right? There is this whole notion of of data gravity, right? So if you get this data in, all of a sudden, right, this becomes a lot easier to kind of stay and and live in that environment. And that's where I think you, you saw a lot of it, even in the expo halls. There were a lot of really interesting things that were taking advantage of some of their SageMaker upgrades and everything. So um, that was that was definitely, I think, a, a, a big theme. Um, th- yeah, th- I'd say that was definitely a big theme. My takeaway as as a consumer of cloud and from an architecture standpoint, I guess, would be number one, how. How far are they going to go into the apps? I heard quite a few, uh, arg- uh, a few announcements around business apps and whatnot, kind of going into the very much distinct SaaS model. And then from just the cloud consumer side, is keep in mind of keep in mind the notion of data gravity. Right? Just remember, once I make a decision of putting some data somewhere, there's implications later that I should keep in mind, right? Of moving that out and what that means for my architecture. Since you did talk about data, I want to go a bit deeper into uh, data. You also talk about applications. We'll talk about that in two separate discussions. Let's talk about data. First of all, uh, data gravity has been a big challenge. Companies do, it's not that you know you'll suddenly move everything and move to a different platform altogether, but the thing is folks don't like their data. Application, they can come and up, but data is the real value. That is the real asset. So, so talk a bit about uh, what kind of concerns you have seen from customers. It could be you know either customers who are on other platforms cloud data centers as well and do you see this is a reaction to that or this is where you see was a long-term plan of aws and it was just an evolution of their data policies and data strategy uh, you know what maybe they were that brilliant and forward thinking uh, they they do have a, a ton of smart folks uh, i'm certainly not going to be grudging that but regardless what what we see people asking and, and needing is and I don't know if they thought of the the data gravity problem. We certainly have it, but it's it's more than just data gravity. It's where it is when I need it. Because yes, I can have and and we see that in, in cloud products like various iterances of uh, of S three between cold storage and how quickly do you need it and where and when and everything. Right. So I think the situation where we're at now is certain things need to be very distributed, very accessible, very quickly. Certain data data sets. Uh, inventory data, if I'm talking about commerce, right? Potentially financial transaction data, right? Part of the whole reason uh, fraud is so hard to detect is the data isn't that distributed for me to make a, a decision. I have to submit something and kind of wait a little bit. So there's a ton of spots where it's great, keep it in one place, but I also need certain subsets of that data to be in the place where I need them so that I can do some compute on, right? Like even a light compute, right? But we still have a data distribution problem 
as much as we do a distributed compute edge problem. And I'd argue the former, the data problem is harder, right? Because you can do this kind of serverless compute everywhere. It's how do we distribute the data and make it make it not a big computer science problem, right? One the developers can actually consume and, and take advantage of. And, that, and that's where I think this whole comes back, right? Whether it's regar regarding sovereignty or, or compliance or just usage. Uh, you can take the easy way and just stick it in one centralized place and put all these controls on it, but you can imagine the resulting service from such an architectural approach. Now I want to talk about applications or SaaS kind of. The, 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 the tricky uh, situation is there, uh, whether it's AWS or any other cloud provider, you do want to serve your customers as better as you can, but then you also have very strong partner ecosystem where other players are bringing that value. So you have to sometimes maintain the balance. How do you look at this approach uh, where you know they're also kind of focusing on applications? You know what, they absolutely can. Because I think if you look at their size, and honestly, I'm not sure I'd make an entirely different decision if I was in, in their shoes, right? They have to show, they have to show after all these years of massive investment, they have to show new markets, right? They have to show revenue growth in different verticals. They have all these metrics as a publicly traded company that they have to address. And they are leveraging a lot of those markets that they operate in. Yes, sometimes they're competitive, but are you not going to address the market because you might anger 0.1% of your customer base or 0.2%? They're massive enough that it's 0.2, right? Um, and, and not to, good or bad, the reality is Akamai competing with somebody like Disney is, right, we're, that's not where we are, right? We are, we're, we're a technology company, again, I'm not a plug for Akamai, just kind of where, where we are in terms of what, what the idea is to serve. So, yeah, I, I get what they're doing, and yeah, they have a great logistics thing. I, yeah, they're selling it. Right. If you look at some of the announcements around data, it was around supply chain. Right. It was around AI. It's about around a bunch of stuff that I'm if I had to bet a nickel, it had to do with some of the stuff that they've learned from operating an amazingly, massively efficient logistics network. So, um, yeah, that's where a, a, somebody like them would be going. I guess, you you know, part of the thing is you'd probably have to be a bookstore or like a logistics company to come up with it as good as they have. Um, so, you know, it's maybe a little bit of a unique situation. But, yeah, I. I Get it. Now let's talk a bit about uh, observability, monitoring. Uh, first of all, last year, uh, it depends on how you look at observability, whether it's to improve performance, security, but there was a big discussion. The, the field is maturing, uh, projects, open source projects are maturing. Uh, a lot of companies are looking at it, observability as you know a core of their you know, uh, practices. So talk a bit about um, what did you see there what kind of trend did you see there? And also, if you can talk in general, how you have seen the evolution of observability space and how AWS is responding to that. I think it was so clear whether it was when you land at the airport, when you were walking through the space, the ads, the auxiliary spaces, the expo center had a, a village for observability was huge. The, the vendors in the space were, were, were massive. Datadog is a one that you undeniably can't call out. Uh, I am a massive, massive fan being a, a, a ops person from, from, from back in the day. The idea that you can look at things and all in one place, this is one thing that I will, will give it. Uh, while the word multi-cloud, I wouldn't argue, was uttered by a, an Amazon employee. The implication was there, especially around observability, was the understanding this reality that you have to measure a lot. So that was that was very good because I, I personally have, have kind of used the tools in some anger in the past. And I, I love the idea, right? Deploy, get, get some visibility in, but it's not just X distribution. It's also the vertical kind of distribution, right? Because I can manage IOPS, I can manage egress, I can manage CPU virtual otherwise or number of containers, and that's good. But it's not the entire story because my visibility really stops at, at egress point. And if I'm really managing this and I'm managing the, you know, the support center, I'm trying to keep an eye on the calls, I need to see what happens. There's a lot of internet between that region and the users. So the idea that a lot of the observability, and again, uh, 
independent, but Data Dog had a big booth and I stopped by there. Uh, they have been, uh, they added, uh, expanded, I should say, rather, uh, real G monitoring, something that we've been, and I personally have been a, a huge fan of, uh, to add to the infrastructure, right? So the idea is, yes, I know how much my infrastructure is doing, I know how many containers I'm spinning up and down, I know where my I.O. is at, I know how much is egressing, but as a result, my user is getting XYZ experience. And given the fact that these days, most of us deal with, not all, but a, at least a, a large percentage of us deal with, with mobile and web-based applications, the technology and standard from anyone you want to get open source or you know pay somebody to do it uh, is out there. And it's, it's really great to look at that whole thing, right? So look at performances at X and a Y, right? How, much, how many IO, right? How much egress am I doing? That's great, optimize there, but also What's the impact, right? Minimize how much you're delivering. Maybe I start need to think, start thinking about moving some compute out closer to the user, right? Because fundamentally, the round trips are killing you. Uh, that kind of two-dimensional monitoring I saw a lot of, and I thought is really, really great. And it's making it easier to actually do, right? You can always, well, often kind of do it, but uh, now it's becoming accessible and actionable which is is huge, again, from a very opsy kind of performance background. You did touch upon that, but I want to go a bit deeper into, first of all, the realization of that we live in multi-cloud world, and when we talk of multi-cloud, it's hybrid cloud, it's even, it also includes mainframe. That's the reality of modern world. So, so, talk, a, yeah, so talk a bit about uh, not just the expo area, but the discussion that you had in the hallway tracks. How much multi-cloud, hybrid cloud was there? So there is, and this is one place where it's worth defining because definitions may vary. Uh, multiple public clouds, uh, private cloud, and a public cloud you would consider hybrid just for the sake of this discussion. Uh, even private data center, right? Because I know a lot of people are like, well, I don't have a private cloud, I have a private data center. Sure, let's just, for the sake of this, call it your own stuff, be it colo, be it data center, be it containerized, be it whatever, mainframe. It, it could be even open stack in you know, a cloud. You know, running exactly, cloud, yeah. right? you could have exactly, your, your local open stack. So if you call that hybrid, there was a lot of talk of that. And you basically you saw, you saw that in Outpost, you saw that in, hey, we can extend the benefits that you know, we all know about at AWS specifically in cloud in general in the management terms, extend that out to your data center, right? So in that way, hybrid was there. I don't know that it, it, it ticked a majority of the sessions. Uh, Multi-cloud, yeah, it was, it was there in the expos. It was there as every vendor kind of, like we said, acknowledges the reality of reality. Uh, where, where the talk was is at least, again, in the folks that we knew and the analysts, there was a lot, still a ton, a ton of on-premise. It's, it's not gone away. Uh, some folks, I'd say 50%. Yes, you have a lot of cloud native applications, right? The more startup-y companies, those folks. But anyone that didn't start in 20, mid-2000s, you probably have infrastructure that is not in the cloud that you have to deal with. And maybe some of it is moving it, yes. Uh, and there are you know, solutions all the time that make that easier. And maybe some of it is just connecting it because for some whatever reason, uh, you need to do it. You need to keep it there because of you have a team, it's still economically viable, you're still writing off the infrastructure, right? The capital investment, whatever the reason is. But I think that's that's certainly the reality. And going back to our our hybrid thing, that's that's why you see it, right? And this even goes beyond AWS. We had some some customer discussions afterwards. It's it, it, it very easily half, depending on who you're talking to, uh, still has infrastructure and, and servers, mainframes as well. Uh, they have to manage, and you see it, right? IBM has a mainframe offering. AWS has a mainframe offering. Um, my can't say for certain with Azure, so I won't. Let's talk about like kind of zoom out of AWS in general, but just talk about uh, you know cloud in general. As you talk about, we talk about multi-cloud, we hybrid cloud. We uh, also talk about edge, which is totally different. You know, and with the evolution, oh, sorry, with the with the, all the improvement that are happening with the five G private network, a lot of things are are are, are happening. Uh, when you looked at this. AWS reInvent, and when you look at 2023, 
where do you see the industry? I'm not talking about just AWS ecosystem. Industry is heading and how cloud providers, players like yourself and Amazon are trying to like prepare themselves so that the world is ready to move into the next phase. I think at, as it stands, I am of the strong opinion and I would argue that even Gartner, the Gartners and, and IDCs and, and all those folks of the world would, would are, are coming on board. There is a distinct difference in edge networks. And I would further say that the logical way to, to, to segment the market in as it stands today is into the kind of mobile provider based and the cloud based. Take, again, use AWS as an example, uh, uh, Wavelength. Is there 5G agreement with Verizon and you have certain workloads and certain formats, you know, certain types of compute and storage that you have in these very different locations. What kind of locations? They are where Verizon is, they are national, uh, they are targeting, you know, millisecond order, millisecond latency kind of things. Thinking industry, thinking, you know, that kind of stuff where I need to process. Uh, and that's just one of them, right? You can look all over the world and NTT, Orange, right? Voda, they're all doing these types of things. AT&T with Jasper, same idea. Uh, they don't, they are huge, but they are not global. Uh, the cloud providers, right, have the opportunity to span. And now I'm starting to talk about like the Akamai's and the cloud fronts and, you know, the cloud flares of the world that do have very global edge networks. Uh, the degree in size can be argued which and will later, but fundamentally different premise, right? You're not near the cell tower, right? You're near the cell tower. You're not in the cell tower, which I'd argue you're really never near the cell tower as a former mobile engineer, but we'll let that one slip for now. Uh, so they're fundamentally different approaches and there are going to be use cases for both. Um, if I dare ensure looking like a fool and by making a prediction is the IOT stuff maybe <clears throat> is going to be the super low latency, the very commercial uh, applications are going to maybe be more wireless provider because honestly, how much IOT do you need cross international, like from one provider, uh, right? Think trucking companies, B2B, that kind of thing. But the more B2 consumer use cases, you have global audiences, right? Whether you're an OTT provider, an e-commerce provider, a gaming provider, you know, insert me social media, the list goes on and on. Those folks aren't going to do edge likely with a certain geographically restricted kind of carrier type of edge network, right? They're going to need a cloud provider for lack of a, 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 a better term, right? They can scale globally, can do all the stuff like the folks I mentioned. So that's where I kind of see edge, ed, edge going. And I think what I, what I would argue, and, and a little nit I'd pick with AWS, is they're just throwing the word edge around everywhere, right? Like, even I saw a couple things on local zones, like 24 is not a local zone. I mean, there's metros where 24 pops, we, you know, you have an edge like with 24 pops, but I digress. I, I think that, that'll be an interesting thing where you see edge play out. Pavel, thank you so much for taking time out today and, of course, share, you know, your thoughts uh, about the reinvent. Uh, and thanks for sharing some of those insights there, what you saw, what was missing, what was present. And as usual, I would love to have you back on the show, but I really appreciate your time. Really thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, yeah, I might, uh, might take you up on that. <laughs>